Thank you, Peter. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to welcome you and officially open the 36th Oil and Money Conference today. On behalf of Energy Intelligence, our long-established partners, the International New York Times, and our esteemed sponsors, a brave new world of energy, the title of this year's conference reflects the challenges we face from the new fundamentals of surpluses and how to manage them. We will discuss, debate, and partner on the key developments that are triggering the biggest questions and decisions facing the oil and gas industry now and in the future. To quote Aldous Huxley, one believes things because one has been conditioned to believe them. In his dystopian novel, Brave New World, he identifies the alphas as the pioneers in a development of civilization. The leaders gathered here at Oil and Money represent an important part of those who will reshape the global energy resource base to benefit future generations and also play a vital role in managing climate change and the current resource abundance. I believe everyone here today has an important role to play in shaping the key decisions on how to manage in this brave new world, which is the focus of this year's conference. From a period of high oil prices through the first decade of this millennium, with its peak in 2008, to the unprecedented decline this last year, with its lowest point in six years just this last August, which took us back to the price levels of 1980 when this conference began. We are confronted with many fundamental differences in the market today, which we will analyze. Just as the rise of China dramatically changed the demand curve, the rapid growth of shale production with the energy renaissance in the US has fundamentally changed the supply curve. Meanwhile, geopolitical factors that have caused so much market anxiety and added risk premiums to oil prices have been almost eliminated from the market equation. Since November 2013, when Iran and the P5 plus one signed the framework agreement of nuclear negotiations, market conditions started to shift. With the surge in shale oil outputs and the US heading towards self-sufficiency and possibly becoming a net exporter, the oil market moved from a seller's market to a buyer's market. Saudi Arabia and OPEC then decided not to cut supply in response to falling oil prices, as they sought to drive out high production costs and curtail the shale revolution and rising non-OPEC supply. Adding further complications is the quantitative easing by central banks that has made credit readily available, making shale, heavy oil, and certain mega projects less sensitive to the decline in M price. With low oil prices, renewables now also face a big challenge, as they may become unaffordable unless governments subsidize with policies to make them you know, um, further um, enhanced in this difficult market of low oil prices. On the money side, the financial pressure are immense across the industry. Oil-dependent countries like Venezuela, Nigeria, are going into dire straits. Cost-cutting is the mantra everywhere, from Brazil to Canada to Russia. However, projects continue to be financed by those that have the financial strength, while the smaller, less robust players suffer. A significant constant over the years is the Oil and Money Conference. It remains the platform that draws elite leaders and thinkers together, sharing their views and insights. This year, a monumental shift in policy occurred with the conclusion of the Iran nuclear agreement, a negotiation process that energy intelligence covered closely and correctly predicted the outcome. Will Iran introduce upstream petroleum contract structures that are attractive for the international oil companies pursuing complex projects in an era of lower prices will and which companies will be eligible. We look forward to these remarks on issues from His Excellency Syed Hosseini, Chairman of Iran's Oil Count Contract Restructuring Committee. We will also hear one year on from Patrick Pouillonnet on Total's developments including the Abu Dhabi onshore concession 
where it is the only major oil company partner. We will look at plans the company has to manage its resource during the economic shift that all in the industry are facing. At Energy Intelligence, our mission of being pioneers in energy and geopolitical news and analysis has helped us become the essential business source for supporting strategic decision making. Our advisory services help companies and governments qualify opportunities and risks. As they have done for nearly 65 years, our team of journalists and analysts around the world strive to go beyond the news to provide context, explanation, and implica implications, getting to the core and the nuances of what matters in a way that only years of experience, skill, and access to broad and trusted networks permit. For example, this year, Energy Intelligence was very much at the forefront of identifying and measuring the unprecedented resilience of US shale oil production, and also of assessing the significant access to capital that independent producers have received despite the oil drop. Tonight, we will be honoring Rex Tillerson, ExxonMobil's Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, who has been chosen by his peers to receive the Petroleum Executive of the Year Award for 2015. You can read his interviews in Petroleum Intelligence Weekly and numerous sector articles. These cover all aspects of the company's widely respected reputation for strong operational performance, financial discipline, project execution, and technological innovation. We also look forward to hearing directly from him here at the conference. Later today, we will be presenting the Leader for New Energy Award to Statoil. This is the first time a large company has won the award, and it reflects Statoil's increased engagement in the climate debate this year. We will cover in depth the carbon climate issue for the oil and gas industry in the run-up to the Paris Summit in December which all eyes in the industry are now on. Energy Intelligence has been monitoring this issue well before even the industry acknowledged its importance. Here are some of the highlights of our recent coverage on issues that will be discussed at the conference. In our oil market coverage, particularly in oil market intelligence, we projected and tracked the surplus accurately and explained why the run-up in oil prices in the second quarter was not sustainable, as it indeed turned out not to be. We have provided excellent analysis examining full implications of the price collapse. Just one example is the PIW story explaining the new Saudi market share strategy is a new manifestation of resource nationalism. On a natural gas side, the shift in prices has also prompted a response in the overall structure of gas markets which we have followed with our strategic trends and business competitive intelligence services. This change has challenged some of the traditional heavyweights in the global LNG market, especially Qatar, who have sought to defend traditional structures. We also correctly foresaw the shift in OPEC policy last November. Through our bottom-up analysis and historic understanding of Saudi policy drivers, and have continued to lead the pack in our coverage of Saudi and OPEC policy. There will be much more such coverage in energy intelligence publications at the conference. However, now we are delighted that you can join us from all corners of the world to participate in what will be an impressive global agenda and to benefit from all those in attendance around you. It is now my great pleasure to hand you over to Stephen Dunbar Johnson, President International, the New York Times Company. Stephen. Thank you, Lara, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's incredible to think how much can and indeed has changed in the 12 months since we last gathered here. As Lara pointed out, even by past standards, these um, shifts that we have seen accelerate dramatically over the past 12 months are really shaping up to be momentous. It is indeed a brave new world of energy. It's this new world's dynamism, uncertainty, and the myriad challenges and opportunities it creates 
for the industry and its leaders, which will be the focus of our examination, conversation, and debate over the next two days. But for me, behind all the noise and numbers, there seems to be a common theme, namely a laser-like discipline or focus on capital discipline. So I'm very much looking forward to the two sessions with top industry leaders to discuss how they are coping with low prices, including one with one of the godfathers of shale oil, Mark Papa, former EOG Resources CEO. But further complicating and feeding the oil price fall is the, app, the backdrop of an ever-changing geopolitical landscape, as we all know. The West's relationship with Russia remains strained and stuck. In fact, it's becoming increasingly so. Libya is a failed state. The conflicts in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen will continue to beg very significant questions and clearly have major ramifications on the industry and the global economy writ large. And of course, we must also consider the re-emergence of Iran. It's going to be extremely interesting to hear from His Excellency Sayed Mahdi Hosseini from the Iranian Ministry of Petroleum later on today. But what, too, of the transitioning Chinese economy and its inevitable impact on the global economy? All of these topics will be addressed by our geopolitical session. It should be absolutely riveting. And, of course, there is climate change and the role we must play in tackling it. A global carbon reduction framework will likely emerge from the COP21 talks in Paris in just two months' time. We all know that it's an enormous issue. It's extraordinarily complex, with the impact solutions, policy ideas, business models, hot topics of debate among those within and outside of the industry. Whether it is the fossil fuel divestment movement or the all the divergence in opinion between some of the world's largest oil companies on carbon pricing, the landscape has shifted to a point where the industry simply must engage actively. The issue of stranded assets due to much tighter carbon controls, which was raised by the Governor of the Bank of England just last week, I think reinforces the challenges facing fossil fuel executives. So again, the session we have on this topic should be riveting. To many of you, I appreciate these themes are all well known, getting to the heart of how to manage these developments to maximize value, whether technological, financial, social, or political, whilst also ensuring sustainable growth is the big questions we help to frame. At the New York Times, our primary duty is to report without fear or favor on world events to help our readers make sense of an increasingly complex world. Free and open reporting and debate are essential for this. But ladies and gentlemen, this is not an easy task when, as Freedom House in the US re recently pointed out in their Freedom of the Press report, global press freedom has declined to its lowest point in almost 10 years. To its lowest point in almost 10 years. The report pointed out that only one in seven people live in countries where coverage of political news is robust. Safety of journalists is guaranteed. State intrusion of media affairs is minimal. And the press is not subject to onerous legal and economic pressure. So thanks to the programming skills and expertise of our partners at Energy Intelligence, we are therefore fortunate to be able to gather here at this forum where we can discuss these issues openly and freely and we are, where we are also able to agree, and ladies and gentlemen, disagree openly and freely. It is why I believe that after 36 years, this conference continues to be the preeminent forum for energy executives, ministers, and experts to share their strategies, tactics, and opinions about the industry's most pressing issues. Knowledge, especially in these turbulent times, is crucial. So, I would like to extend our sincerest thanks to all of our generous sponsors, Chevron, Rosnet, ANH, Columbia, Mobdala, Petroleum, Total, Schlumberger, ExxonMobil, UBS, 
Weatherford, Sonangol, bear with me, it goes on a while, uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, PDVSA, the Carlyle Group, Orange, NASO Energy, that is, Orange NASO Energy, Mercantile and Lukoil, as well as our leaders for tomorrow's sponsors, Weatherford, Mercantile, and Lukoil. I mention you all because the success of this event is as much down to the ongoing support of our sponsors as it is to the level of thought-provoking debate and networking we have inside and also outside of this room. Lastly, I would like to congratulate the recipients of this year's Oil and Money Leadership for tomorrow's scholarships. Hannah Braun. I'm gonna, I hope I don't uh, brutalize your names, but I fear I may. Dennis Fiokistov. Dennis, are you here? Congratulations. Did I, did I ruin that? Your name? Did I, sorry. Uh, Vanina Georgin. Good. Sebastian Guiton. Jennifer Hoyan. Uh, Waiki Lee. Stephen Muller. Paula Dongo. And Frederick Ritter. Ladies and gentlemen, please give them a round of applause for being here. I was not part of the judging panel, but I was told that this year's crop of scholars is extraordinarily impressive and bodes very well for the future leadership of this industry, which is going to be much needed given the challenges we all face. So please, if you encounter our scholarship recipients during the next couple of days, I hope you will make them feel welcome and do your utmost to field any questions they may have. Now, I'm certain that you are all keen to dive into the program, so at, without any further hesitation, I would like to turn the proceedings over to Nordine Luisini, who is going to introduce our first session this morning. Thank you very much. <laughs> 